Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our first occasional lecture for 2014. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and paying respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Now, 30 years ago, when I first joined the Commonwealth Public Service, the highlight of my first few days was a visit to the National Press Club to see our minister deliver a speech on, oh, electoral reform. At the time, I'm not sure which was more boring, the rubber chicken or the speech, but you know, things have moved on. I'm now clerk of the Senate and I have quite an interest in electoral topics. And I'm very pleased today to be able to welcome Anthony Green, very well known electoral ana analyst, um, Mr. Elections, in fact, to, to uh, most of us here in the audience. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge about electoral matters and has been covering elections for, uh, for a great many years for the ABC. And uh, he's going to begin with though, that uh, set of reforms in 1984, which, we, uh, uh, which introduced ticket voting, among other things, for the, uh, for the Senate, and also things like the recognition of party names on the ballot paper, and uh, to see where those reforms have actually led us today. And I hope you might have some suggestions about what we do. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Anthony Green. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I can I read this without my glasses? Yes, good. All right. um, last September, um, I, like all residents of New South Wales, was presented with a peculiar physical challenge in exercising my democratic right in the election for senators. In a voting petition 600 millimetres wide, I was required to manipulate a ballot paper one metre wide containing 110 candidates across 46 columns in a typeface so small the Australian Electoral Commission issued voter magnify, vote magnifying sheets so voters could read their ballot papers. Even voters hale of limb and acute of vision would have found this process awkward, let alone those less supple of limb or challenged of sight. Trying to find a candidate while moving a ballot paper backwards and forwards across your voting petition with your magnifying sheet in one hand, using the pencil in the other hand to try and fill it in, periodically putting one or other down while one moved the ballot paper before filling in a little bit more of it was a very difficult challenge and not one easily undertaken with the usual complement of two hands in the, as a standard feature of the human body. This was, and this was even before you had the difficulty of trying to keep track of your sequence of preferences from one to 110. As you moved your ballot paper back and forth and sequentially changed hands with a magnifying sheet and the pencil and suddenly thought, what was the last number, 69? You know, you just, it was a very difficult exercise. And don't lose your house ballot paper while you're doing this either. Now, knowing something about the voting process, I came prepared. I'd used one of the websites on the internet, which allowed you to work out your own sequences of below the line preferences. And it would then print out this very helpful series of A4 pages, which you would bring along. And I spent 10 minutes transcribing those numbers onto my ballot paper. It's 10 minutes of my life I will never get back, but I did my bit for democracy. Now, more than 98% of Australian voters didn't go to my effort. Sensibly, when faced with having to engage in the physical manipulation, mental arithmetic, and pre-preparation required to cast a below the line vote, most voters plumped to use the above the line option with a single preference for preferred party. That is if they could find their preferred party given the array of candidates on the ballot paper. But what were those rational voters looking for, voting for? From my examination of ticket votes, if you voted for one of the major parties or the Greens, then your vote, if distributed as preferences, probably ended up where you expected it to end up. Most of the, the, the major parties and the Greens tended to have perfectly logical sequences of preferences. But, su but support for the minor parties at the last election reached a record 32.2%. And if you exclude the Greens from that, that group, it's 23.5%. So nearly one in five Australians voted for a minor or micro party on the ballot paper. And very few people who did that would have bothered to look up what those preference tickets were. But even then, even a well-informed voter who inspected all the tickets 
would be lucky to have worked out the implication of any of those preference tickets. You would need a huge number of assumptions about the order that candidates and parties were going to finish on the ballot paper so that you know, knew the order of exclusion to then work out how the preference tickets applied and therefore where those preference tickets ended up. And a good example of that was in Western Australia with a still disputed election where a cutoff between two candidates with one and three quarter percent of the vote each less than 20 votes between the two of them, determined where some of these minor party votes ended up. Whether your preferences elected Clive Palmer or the, or the sports party, uh, Clive Palmer's party's candidate or the sports party, was entirely determined by this cutoff between the Shooters Party and the Australian Christians, which any voter looking at the tickets and determining who to vote for would have had no ability to assess which order the candidates finished in. So I, I would argue that the ticket preferences are just too complex for people to understand. And in the end, it's not mentioned often enough in the textbooks, but simplicity should be a criteria for designing an electoral system. And that simplicity should apply both to the options offered to voters and the ability of the votes to be counted. And I would say our system is too complex for voters to understand, and the counting method has become too complex. Even if a voter had been prepared and had come along and did know the ordering of all the groups, at some point in their ordering of a ballot paper, a voter who wanted to blow the line would have had to resort to randomly numbering preferences between candidates they knew absolutely nothing about. All this, is, again, is assuming they could find the candidate they wanted to vote for on this ballot paper. As we've seen with the confusion between the Liberal Democrats and the Liberals and Nationals in New South Wales, on a gigantic ballot paper, it is always possible it is always easy to make a mistake and to not find the candy you were looking for. My question is this about the last Australian Senate election. Australia is a nation that introduced the secret ballot to the world, that led the world in broadening the franchise to first adult males and then to all females as well. How has a nation with this democratic tradition managed to produce a Senate election that is incomprehensible to all but the most cephalogically skilled? To conduct a Senate election whose result will be determined by Byzantine deals between unknown backroom operators is bad enough, but to give voters only two options in voting, to accept the deals or to be forced to number 110 preferences, is an abuse of the power granted to the Commonwealth to determine the forms of, of voting for both Houses of Parliament. An election is a process by which the will of the electorate is translated into representation in a Chamber of Parliament. In the case of the current Senate system, the will of the people can be interfered with by the strict control of preferences granted to political parties by group ticket or above the line voting systems. How did we get to this impasse and what are its solutions? The te textbooks rightly point, I'll go back momentarily to the original formation design of the Senate. The textbooks rightly point out to the, the, the debate in the constitutional conventions of the structure of the Senate was critical to Federation. Equal representation for the states in a chamber effectively equally empowered to the House was critical to Federation. And even, even if it was in conflict with the conflict concept of responsible government, that most, if the concept of responsible government in the lower house, a principle to which those who drew up the constitution were also committed. As it turned out from the very first election in 1901, the Senators of State's House has always been something of a, of a straw, straw man argument, though one, it's the one that's still passionately defended to this day. It is the Senate's other role as a House of Review that has proved to be more important, and, but one that was not truly realised until after the introduction of proportional representation in 1949. But as I always have to remind people, the Constitution is largely silent on the matter of electoral systems. The change role of the Senate since 1949 came about from the change in the electoral system, not because of its power, the powers of the Constitution. It is why there should be a serious debate about the Senate's electoral system, because it, in the light of the 2013 election, the best way to bring the Senate into disrepute is to continue with an electoral system which has come into disrepute. The debate over the Senate representation and the creation of the double dissolution deadlock provision in section 57 <clears throat> too often overlooks the constitutional convention and its role in creating the world's first properly elected national upper house based on a, on a franchise the same as the lower house. It's, it's something we completely overlook that the Senate was a properly elected chamber at a time when they were upper house when they were very rare around the world. The models available to the drafters were the appointed New South Wales and Queensland upper houses the restricted franchise upper houses in other colonies, the appointed Canadian Senate, and the US Senate, which at the time was still not yet 
properly elected. Some of the states still appointed the delegates. Guess what I forgot to do before I came? <laughs> Go away. go away. <laughs> Let's put it into flight mode. That's always the best solution. Probably someone wanted to ring me up about this speech. <laughs> what are you saying to the Senate today? Well, just listen. No, Wi-Fi. No, back. Don't you love technology? There we go. Have a glass of water while I'm here. Um, instead, the Constitutional Convention crafted Section 8 of the Constitutional Convention crafted Section 8 of the Constitution that stated that the Senate's franchise would be the same as the House. Quite a radical departure from Australian practice at the time. Perhaps knowledge that the Commonwealth would not have responsibility for land laws was one of the reasons that the Conservatives of the day chose not to block um, a broader franchise for the Senate, which they were doing at the time for legislative councils. More often quoted in relation to the Senate's electoral system is the first part of section seven, which states that the Senate shall be composed of senators for each state directly chosen by the people of the state voting until the parliament otherwise provides as one electorate. According to Quick and Garin's annotated constitution of Australia, the original version of this section from the 1891 constitutional conventions did not include popular election. The equivalent section in the 1891 draft stated that senators would be directly chosen by the Houses of Parliament of the several states. There was a motion to follow the United States model of allowing the states to choose their own method, but the view was of the 1891 convention that the, the method should be uniform. It was the 1897 convention that modified that, removed the words Houses of Parliament and put the words people there. The debate then continued about the best method to, to elect the Senate, whether it should be the state should be subdivided or elected as a whole. And in the 1897 conventions, the words until the parliament otherwise provided was inserted. So the first election was going to be, except for in Queensland by a later amendment, the first election was going to be as a whole, but then the parliament would sort it out from that point on. The convention left the new parliament to decide the electoral system, but incidentally, it's left a loophole there to this day, which means that if the parliament so chose, it could abolish proportional representation and introduce individual electorates for the Senate. As John Ewer and, Ewer and others have pointed out, um, the debate on the Commonwealth's first electoral act in 1901, 1902, 1902 um, looked at proportional representation, but at the time chose not to go down that path. Um, although it was a, a clearly a consideration which was coming from the 1890s, it was part of the debate over electoral systems at the time, but the parliament stepped away from it in 1902. What the parliament instead adopted was block voting, where, where in each state, with three senators to be elected, a vote was given three votes and you just crossed the boxes next to the three senators you voted for. Of course, we had, option, we had pref, um, first past the voting in the House in those days, you used a sim simple one. How the Senate's electoral system has evolved since then has been driven by two interactions. One has been with changes to the House's electoral system, but the second has been by inducing and at times copying experiments with electoral systems that have occurred at the state level. It's often overlooked in our national literature, but much of the experimentation with electoral systems in Australia has occurred at state level, and it's at Commonwealth level that it later on gains more attention. <clears throat> the key interaction with the House elections was the introduction of preferential voting in 1919. If voters were, re were required to number their House ballot papers, then some change needed to be the set change needed to be made to the Senate's electoral system so that voters also numbered that ballot paper. Block voting was replaced by exhaustive preferential voting. Um, where a voter needed to number three squares on the ballot paper. Um, there may be a matter of detail there, I've got wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was three at the time. Um, and then the, the election was conducted as a single member electorate. One person was elected, that person was then excluded, their preferences distributed and an election conducted for a second member. And the second member was excluded and the count would then continue to elect a third member. In essence, this was exactly the same as block voting. The electoral outcomes <clears throat> were almost exactly the same. In almost every state, one party would win all three seats, three seats, what became known as the windscreen wiper effect, that a small swing from one party to the other would sw swing all seats from one side of politics to the other. And until 1949, the Senate, in, for that reason, was a, a rather ineffectual chamber. 
along with the preference, what was more important in 19, in some senses, was the new form of ballot paper that was adopted. That up until then, the ballot paper was a vertical ballot paper with candidates listed in alphabetical order. With the introduction of preferential voting and the change to exhaustive preferential voting in the Senate, the candidates were grouped together on the ballot paper. So it was easier to find the three Labor candidates or the three Nationalist candidates that were grouped together on the ballot paper. This change was to have a major effect on how proportional representation changed in Australia in future years. Further changes followed in the 1930s when they introduced full preferential voting for the, for the Senate to avoid people confusing the two, two, two ballot papers. And then there was a change introduced in 1937 because of an interesting electoral ruse by the New South Wales Labor Party. The 1937 election, there were four senators up for election in New South Wales, and the Labor Party nominated four candidates whose names started with A. In those days, the ballot paper was structured so that the, there would be a formula applied to the first letters of the names of the candidates, and then they'd all work out an ordering across the ballot paper. And by picking four candidates whose names started with A, the Labor Party got the left-hand column. This was viewed as a bad thing. In 1940, they introduced a change to have a draw for lot for what position on the ballot paper to get rid of the four A's. But there was also another significant change introduced which had consequences later was that parties, instead of having their candidates listed in alphabetical order, were permitted to list them in the order they wished to have them listed on the ballot paper. That had an impact when proportional representation was introduced later. At the time, it had no impact because whatever order your three candidates were listed, if the, swing, the vote was for your party, you'd get all three seats. So it didn't matter the order, but that change was introduced in 1940 and had consequences later. I'll come back to the proportional representation because I'm now gonna move on to talk about how the states led the field in this area. The system that we call proportional representation is known more correctly in the international political science literature as proportional representation by single transferable vote. It is only one form of proportional representation and by far the least common. In most other countries, it's used in Australia quite widely. widely. It's used in um, wildly as well sometimes. It's also used in Ireland, it's used in Malta, it's used for Scottish local government, and there's some other <clears throat> smaller implementations around the world. It was used in Estonia at one stage, as people always remind me. Now, rather than achieving proportionality based on first preferences, as most other forms of PR do, PRSTV uses preferences of excluded candidates and the surplus votes of candidates with more than a quota to determine the finally elected members. It's a much more complex method of counting, but it gives voters a lot more say over, who, over candidates. Its original proponent in the English speaking world, there was a Dane who proposed something very similar, whose name I remember, and he's now always registered in the uh, literature. But when I was learning this, it was all about Thomas Hare, who was an English advocate of voting reform. He proposed this form of proportional representation by single transferable vote. But in his original literature, he was talking more about wasted votes, minimising the number of wasted votes. That if you elect single member electorates, you can waste up to half the votes in people for candidates who don't get elected. His proposal was to allow, was to mean that there were fewer wasted votes, that more people would be elected on the votes that people cast. It was also in a time when there were still multi-member block votes used as electorates. So clearly there was something there which people viewed as a bad system which needed to be replaced by a better alternative. And Hare came up with his system. However, it is a very personal form of voting as originally proposed by Hare and is still used in places like Ireland. Um, the way we use PR is PRSTV on steroids in some cases. It's quite a different system. While everyone will tell you there's a huge difference between the Senate system and hair clerk is used in Tasmania in the ACT, they are fundamentally the same system to the rest of the world. They are based on preferences, they are based on a complex counting system. They are, they are more similar to each other compared to other PR systems than most people in Australia give, give credit. Now, PRSTV was advocated in the 19th century by a number of people but adopted in Tasmania for the first time in the late 1890s to elect some of the state's lower house members. And it was also used for both houses of parliament for the first Commonwealth parliament from Tasmania, both the house and the Senate it was used. That first hair clerk system looked nothing like we know today. Candidates were listed in alphabetical order on a vertical ballot paper. Uh, there were no party affiliations and there was only limited preferences. I'm pretty sure I think there were three preferences allowed in Tasmania right up until the 1970s, so it was limited preferences. 
It was abandoned briefly in the first century after, after a federation in, and then um, picked up again in 1909 in Tasmania and it's been in use ever since with modifications, with the uh, um, Robson rotation, the banning of Hadavo cards and other changes to do with the structure of the ballot paper with which I'll deal with. The system was then adopted in New South Wales in 1920 for its lower house election, um, but with full preferential voting. The problem was that you would have 20 or 30 candidates on the ballot paper and they had a record informal vote of more than 9%. Uh, and this was when under optional preferential voting, uh, sorry, under voluntary voting, not compulsory voting, you got a, an informal rate of 9% under voluntary voting because of confusion over the voting system worked. So sensibly, New South Wales moved to optional pre or limited preferential voting in 1922 and 1929, where you only need to give as many preferences as there were, um, sorry, 1922 and 1925. And then New South Wales went back to single member electorates in 1927. New Tasmania then made the next major change to the Hare Clark system by adopting the Senate's horizontal ballot paper and grouping candidates by party. That was first used in the 1941 election. It retained limited preferences. It retained the alpha list, alphabetic listing of candidates within groups, but they made the shift to using Hare Clark with a horizontal ballot paper with clear identification that the candidates were affiliated with each other. The decision to adopt PRSTV for the Senate in 1949 flowed from the decision to expand the size of the parliament of that election. What was the point of electing, increasing the size of the Senate from 36 to 60 members? If you used the existing electoral system and all you ended up with was 60 members from the same political party rather than 36. Clearly, there was a, there was a logical case, a principled case for proportional representation. There was also a self-interest case that the Labor Party was facing defeat in 1949. And by introducing proportional representation, they would retain the 15 of the 18 members elected in 1946 for the first term of the Menzies government. So clearly there was a significant degree of self-interest involved in why the Labor Party proposed proportional representation in 1949. But as I always say in politics, the best argument in favour of principle is self-interest and is why it's so often used. The Senate's implementation retained several of the features from the old system that the candidates were the ballot paper was horizontal, the candidates were listed in groups, and that the candidates were listed in the order that the parties nominated, not, not in alphabetical order. That had a significant impact because most people tended to vote down the party ticket at Senate elections, that it therefore allowed the party to determine the order that the candidates were elected. And apart from a very tiny number of cases, and I think all of them from Tasmania, senators have always been elected in the order that they're listed on the ballot paper. And that, that is the significance that flows through from that 1940 change and then the adoption of proportional representation. However, the Senate's implementation also included full preferential voting. That was acceptable in the 1950s when you may only have nine or 10, 15, at most 20 candidates on the ballot paper. Voters were able to deal with this and they were able to follow the how to vote card and plus both ballot papers used the same voting system. But in 1974, there was a deliberate attempt to stack the Senate ballot paper in New South Wales at that year's double dissolution, with 73 candidates nominated. The informal vote, unsurprisingly, shot well above 10%. And as you would expect, there were significant delays at polling places and then significant delays in counting these ballot papers. The first reaction to that 1974 ballot paper was in South Australia, which at the time was trying to introduce popular election for the Legislative Council. And in 1975, they introduced a form of list proportional representation. Um, incidentally, a preferential system. It was a, it was a system of list proportional representation where you voted for parties rather than candidates. There was a threshold, so if a party didn't get more than half of a quota is excluded, and preferences were allowed so that if a party was excluded, its second preference could count to a candidate that remained in the count. However, the counting was very simple. Once the candidates were excluded, those simple preferences distributed, the votes of all the remaining parties were tallied, the number of seats were allocated by a simple formula, and then the members allocated based on the party list. It was a very simple system. That was reaction to the, to the, to the full preferential. The next reaction was in New South Wales when the Legislative Council elections were first introduced in 1978. As in South Australia, they toyed with the South Australian system, but they were concerned about informal voting. And so they adopted um, limited preferential voting. You only needed to indicate 10 preferences on the ballot paper 
or 15, as, as it became after 1991, and parties only tended to stand that many candidates. So it became basically a, a much simpler system and the informal voting was not a problem. These state experiments influenced the next major change which came in the 1984 uh, electoral reform bill. The two crucial reforms in that bill, which today are under question, uh, and I think have reached the end of their useful life, are the original changes which allowed the registration of political parties and the inclusion of party names on the ballot papers, and the introduction of um, group ticket voting for the Senate, as we know today with the above the line voting option. At the time, ticket voting was seen as merely a method of formalising what already existed in how to vote cards. Parties were influencing their, how to, their, their distributions of preferences by influence, in, distributing how to vote cards. It was viewed as little more than, than, than in, in, um, formalising that procedure and cutting the um, informal vote. At the time, optional preferential voting was an anathema to the coalition and the Australian Democrats who, opposed its who would have opposed its introduction. So ticker, ticker voting was seen as the solution to informal voting and was not seen as being a radical departure. Of course, there was a self-interest argument. The parties got more control over the tickets. But I mean, at the time, it was raising their control from 80 or 85% to 95%. So it wasn't initially seen as particularly critical. Ticket voting certainly met its, its, its intention of cutting the informal vote from more than 10% to regularly now only 3 or 4%. It's actually nowadays the informal vote is lower in the Senate than it is in the House because the, in fact the Senate ballot paper introduced a new form of informal voting in the lower house of people thinking you could use only a one vote to cast a valid vote and that's been a continuing problem since. What had not been anticipated was that the control over preferences that was attained by major parties would then become available to minor and micro parties and that we would see a profusion of those minor and micro parties as we saw spectacularly at the 2013 election. So how did ticket voting unravel? What we saw in the 2013 election was an explosion of what, I, what I've termed ticket harvesting, a term which has come to become the common usage. It's the deliberate arrangement of preferences between minor and micro parties to try and engineer the election of one of their number. If these preference tickets were done for ideological reasons, you could argue that this tactic is perfectly valid. Although I would argue that I don't see why you should design an electoral system to overcome the inability of like-minded parties to actually get on with each other. Uh, if parties actually agree with each other, then they should get together and form a party on principles they agree with, rather than allow themselves to run in parallel and let the electoral system resolve their internal differences. So uh, even if there's a valid ideological reason for ticket preference harvesting, I'm still not convinced that it's something you necessarily agree with. But if the, per preference, the purpose of preference harvesting is entirely tactical, to turn the election of a member into a lottery of chance ordering, or to interfere with the ability of another candidate with significant purse, purse preferences from being elected, is that a valid tactic? The first example of so-called micro-parties winning election was at the 1995 New South Wales Legislative Council election, the first, time, the first one that uh, occurred after reform of the council, lifting the number of members elected from 15 to 21 and cutting the quota to 4.5%. Alan Corbett was elected for a party called A Better Future for Our Children. He, um, I would stress that his election was a more innocent form of ticket preference ticketing than, um, than the organised version we see today, as several other parties simply liked Corbett and liked his party. It was also due to the very low quota in New South Wales, and the result was more uh, random than manipulated. Corbett polled just 1.28% of the vote, won an eight-year term in Parliament and spent just $1,589 on his campaign. It's a significant reward. Nick Xenophon was the next to uh, profit from this system. He, he, he gained about 2.5% of the vote at the South Australian Legislative Council in 1997 by a similar method. And all the other parties, micro minor parties on the ballot paper, directed preference to him because they liked his no-pokey's message. He, he, he waltzed to victory. But I must say this about Mr Xenophon, of all the people who've been elected by these preference harvesting uh, methods, whether deliberate or accidental, um, he's the only one who's turned the harvesting of preferences into the growing of his own vote. And he's managed to garner quite significant votes in his own right since. These are examples noticed by others, particularly Mr Glenn Drury at the time was interested in the uh, four-wheel drive movement and getting four-wheel drive access to national parks and was interested in trying to do something about the 1999 New South Wales Legislative Council election. 
In 1997, I returned to this issue of preference harvesting in relation to the state election then two years away. I wrote that under current laws, the 1999 New South Wales Legislative Council election could be reduced to political farce. Instead of 21 members elected reflecting the will of the people, the result could be distorted by electoral rorting and voting confusion. I went on to warn about the dangers of the large ballot paper. The result of the election could be determined by voters incapable of reading the ballot paper, unable to manipulate a ballot paper one metre square, or simply bewildered and unable to find the, the, the party they wanted to vote for. The current growth in registered parties is clearly about manipulating this process with a string of stalking horse parties with attractive names running to attract votes that can be delivered as preferences to other related minor parties or to ha perhaps one of the major parties. In research I did after that election, um, there was clear evidence that some of those parties with attractive names attracted voters who, if they voted below the line, directed preferences one way, for instance, towards the Greens, but the ticket of the party went exactly the opposite way. So clearly there was a degree of confusion going on and names being adopted which people would not necessarily understand how preferences would logically flow. The problem has only taken longer to emerge at Senate elections because the quota was higher. It's taken longer to organise and it's taken a further deterioration in the level of support for major parties. And how remarkable that is, is interesting to consider when you look at the issue of the election of Mr Wayne Dropilich to the sports party in Western Australia. I'm well aware this is still before the High Court and the issue of the missing ballot papers could yet see the whole election overturned. But using the count which has elected him, the sports party finished 21st of the 27 parties on the ballot paper. 20 different parties contributed votes through their preference tickets that allowed Mr Dropielich to be elected, with 15 of those parties actually polling a higher vote than the sports party. At three points during the distribution of preferences, Mr Dropielich and the sports party fell to second last in the tally of remaining candidates and parties. And on three occasions, he was rescued by the final candidate in the tally, having directed preferences to him. By any measure under any electoral system in the world, his victory was truly remarkable and is only possible because of the ticket voting system. No other electoral system in the world would have elected Mr Dropilich ahead of so many other parties who polled more votes than him. Fundamentally, what is wrong with the current system is a principle which is inherent in full preferential voting, that all ballot papers have equal weight no matter what point on the ballot paper, whatever preference you are looking at on the ballot paper. And the assumption in a full illustration of preferences by a voter is that the voter holds all those preferences equally and has rationally ordered them that way. If a voter has not rationally got those preferences, if they have simply randomly numbered or they've adopted somebody else's preferences tactically, then a counting system which treats those ballot papers as fundamentally equal at all points is what's causing the problem. If all preferential voting systems have this characteristic that a candidate elected, a candidate with the highest vote who would be elected under first past the post could be defeated, can be defeated on preferences. That is a, a principle. But when it's applied to the Senate system with a bewildering array of candidates and parties and complex preferences deals, which most voters have no ability to understand, then applying that principle to the counting system has got a fundamental problem. Two solutions that have been raised to this, in the end, do away with this idea of that the, the each preference is equal. One is the, the idea of a threshold quota on first preferences before a candidate can be elected. The second is to move towards optional preferential voting where the voter only expresses as many preferences as they have. My problem with a threshold quota is that it's actually a change to the counting system, not a change to the method of voting. I believe that what we need is to give voters a more effective and simple method of ex expressing their preferences, expressing the preferences they do have, rather than them forcing them to go the charade of adopting a set of preferences they don't know, or filling in a series of preferences to candidates they don't know in some random order, simply to have the preferences they do have counted in the first place. I would move towards optional preferential voting. I think it is a fairer system. As a minimum, it must be applied to below the line votes in some form, whether fully optional or whether it be limited preferential where you have to number a certain number. But I would go further and I would recommend um, above the line voting for parties as an alternative. But first, the first thing that has to be moved on is the registration of political parties. Federal law in this area is basically unchanged, but more or less unchanged since 1984. A party requires 500 members to register a party. 
and a $500 deposit and a constitution. That's basically all it has to meet. <clears throat> because of the, the date of the election was announced in September for the 2013 election, parties that wanted to register had a deadline for when they had to be registered. And there was a rush of registration of parties. The number of registered parties increased 50% in the two months before the close of the, uh, the issue of the writ. So there's a 50% increase in parties in that period. There were more parties registered for the 2013 election than ever before. More parties contested the House. More parties contested the Senate. More, more candidates contested both houses than ever before. The average number of candidates per vacancy in the Senate increased to 13, a fourfold increase on two decades ago. The surge in, in registered parties was exactly the same as in 1999 in New South Wales. It was a complete reflection of the similar loose, loose laws applied in the state at that time. What has occurred since then is that uh, the states have tended to tighten their regulations. Most of the states require 500 members in their state where the Commonwealth requires 500 in the country. Most of the states require much pr stronger proof of application to join and acceptance of membership of party. That's not applying at the federal level. But the, the Commonwealth should at least increase the number of registered parties, perhaps to 2,000, and they should require greater proof of membership. They may also consider a cut-off date before an election. As New South Wales, you must be registered to run a New South Wales election 12 months ahead of time. I also think that we should reintroduce nominations for candidates running for the Senate. Um, with registered parties, candidates no longer needed to have nominators. The parties could nominate candidates centrally. And part of the flooding of the Senate ballot paper was done by um, if you look at the Tasmanian ballot paper, large numbers of those candidates on that ballot paper for micro parties did not live in Tasmania. The Liberal Democrat candidate, Clinton Mead, one week after the federal election was elected mayor of Campbelltown in Sydney, even though he was still in the running to represent Tasmania in the Senate. Robbie Swan from the Sex Party has long lived in Canberra. Neither of them had any particular connection to Tasmania, but they were nominated in Tasmania by the central process that perhaps some form of nominators should be reintroduced for the Senate so that states have to therefore have some sort of on the ground presence in each state. Political parties should be more heavily regulated because they have significant advantages. They get their names on the ballot paper and they get, to this, they get this central nomination process. And clearly there needs to be some look again at the process of party names. The courts may have ruled that a rational person can determine the difference between the Liberal Democrats and the Liberals and National Party, but it's absolutely evident from the results of the New South Wales Senate that voters, when presented with 110 candidates and trying to find the party they were looking for, were having difficulty determining the difference between those two parties on the ballot paper. So what would I propose? Well, I propose to keep above the line voting for on the ballot paper to allow people to vote for parties, but I would recommend the getting rid of the party tickets. Parties should lose control over their preferences, as occurs in New South Wales. Um, people can vote one for the Labor Party and two for the Greens, or one for the Greens and two for the Liberals, do whatever they like above the line. But the only preferences should count are the ones the voters fill in. That's the same as it works in the House. Some degree of optionality has to be allowed because there are just too many boxes to fill in on the Senate and people don't know who all these people are. And as I said, people should only have to give the preferences they know. Um, in New South Wales, only 20% of people have taken advantage of this system. The parties haven't actively encouraged people to give preferences above the line. Given the, the higher quota at Senate elections, it would be in the interests of parties to do more work on encouraging people to use the above the line option. Uh, but even if the, the take-up rate is quite low, I still believe it's an advantage above the current system of full tickets. Um, I also in, in believe in optional preferential below the line. Preferences still can, can have an impact under this system, as was proved in New South Wales in 2011. I thought the system would forever be a, list, a form of list PR, but in 2011, there were just enough preferences to prevent Pauline Hanson winning the final seat. So voters actually did have a say and actually did make a difference with their preferences, even under the, under the system I propose. I think um, nomination and deposit laws need to be looked at again. I would rather see the weight go on nomination, uh, on the nomination issue rather than deposit laws. I don't agree in ever increasing um, um, deposit laws. But somewhere or other, there has to be some way of sieving people onto ballot papers. If the consequence of allowing free access to the ballot paper is a ballot paper which confuses voters, then you've got something wrong. Ballot elections and ballot papers are about electing representatives to parliament. If you want to conduct a protest or you want to get involved in some other game which involves getting your name on the ballot paper, then there is a cost, as far as I'm concerned. And if you want to meet that cost and have your say, then do so. But I don't, I'm, I'm always loath to use deposit laws in that way. I think there are other laws to the registration of parties and increasing the method and nominations, um, which would have a bigger effect. Um, 
optional preferential voting does require consequences in terms of changing the formulas to do with how preferences are distributed from candidates with more than a quota. It's a bit complex to go into here, but you would, in my view, want to give greater weight to voters who've given in, filled in preferences rather than have, have them wasted where votes with no preferences get drifted on as part of the distribution of preferences as a technical matter, but is a consequence of, of the principle of adopting some form of optional preferential voting. <clears throat> In conclusion, my aim is to put the power over electing senators back into the hands of the voters. Parties with low votes can still get elected, but they'd have to get a significant number of votes. They'd have to get out there and campaign. And if they want to have some say over their preferences so that their vote can help elect somebody else, then they also have to campaign. If, if the level of vote a party achieves is reflective of the amount of campaigning they do, then I have no, no problem with the idea that their ability to influence preferences is also reflected in their ability to distribute how to vote material and actively campaign. Above all, I want the, it to be left into the hands of the voters as it is in the House. Some would suggest moving to the Hare Clark model, and I no doubt expect to get some questions on this uh, afterwards, complete with Robson rotation, bans on how to vote cards and, and the like. I don't agree with this proposal as there is an issue of scale with Hare Clark. Hare Clark may work well for electing the lower house of parliament in Tasmania in the ACT when the quota is around 10,000 voters, but there is a vast difference of scale in electing the New South Wales Senate with a quota of 600,000 when that election is being conducted at the same time as the lower house of parliament. For all, if the only reason for introducing Robson rotation is to break the control of parties to control the order of election of candidates, then I think it's an artifice which isn't, isn't required. There are other ways to do it and anyway, it's pretty clear and has for a long time that people are voting on party in the Senate. And just because people are voting for parties and you think they should be voting for candidates, I don't see as that a good reason to stop people from voting for parties in that way. I believe the Senate electoral system has been operating as a mecha mechanism of party-based proportional representation since 1949, even though the ballot papers are counted as a candidate-based system. The current system has been in place for three decades and has been and parties and participants have learned how to game the system and some change is needed because the rules need to be changed so that gaming can't continue some would argue that all the part, micro parties have done did in, 19, in 2013 was use the rules the major parties have been happy to use for the last three decades to keep out parties they see, see as undesirable like the nuclear disarmament party and one nation that is entirely true but i still think there is a world of difference in the ability of a party with 40% of the vote to control its preferences and a party with 2% of the vote, 0.2% of the vote. Do away with ticket voting and parties only get control of their preferences if they get out there and campaign. Above all, the Senate electoral, if the Senate electoral system is brought into disrepute, then so is the Senate. And the Senate, is, is, the Senate has been trusted with strong powers under the Constitution and I believe that those powers need to be exercised with a mandate from the, from the population, a democratic mandate that reflects the will of the public. In the 1970s, the use of casual vacancies to manipulate numbers at Senate elections and also to directly manipulate the Senate numbers was viewed as so disreputable that the constitution was changed to prevent it happening again. I think the Senate's current electoral system is being manipulated in a similar, similar way to engineer election results and I therefore am of the view that it should be changed as was the constitution. I think change will happen before the next election. In my view, any change should be towards giving the voters power of, over, over their preferences. And that my view, and, and I'll start that paragraph again because it's important. I think change will happen before the next election. In my view, any change should be towards giving the power over preferential voting back into the hands of the voters. And the, and the view, my view behind these changes to ensure the Senate system we have reflects the will of the electorate and continues with this, and the Senate continues with its important role in the Australian parliamentary setup. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was a fabulous explanation. Now, fortunately, we do have a bit of time for questions, and I'm sure there will be questions. If you have one, I'd invite you to go to the microphone um, and I'll take uh, questions first come, first serve. Sir, run to the microphone, because there's also someone in the gallery <laughs> who's technically first, so I'll give the call to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Mr Green, for your paper. I'd just like to make a quote and a couple of comments. 
and the question followed a number of points and then some concluding comments. Inscribed on the San Diego County Government Building in San Diego in California, these words, good government demands the intelligent interest of every citizen. Thought and consideration should be encouraged in every voter in our elections uh, when they vote. I agree with your uh, point that the automatic uh, progression of the vote on a registered ticket without knowing where it is going is basically the problem. But optional preferential voting itself would turn our proportional system to a semi-proportional system with a remainder left over of the vote uh, for the election of one or more of the last positions or less than a full quota because of the exhausted vote. You quoted New South Wales in 2011, the Legislative Council, the last four positions were elected on less than a full quota because they'd run out of, well, they had some preferences, but they ran out in the end. But that exhausted vote amounted to two or more full quotas in all. So my question is that, first of all, I agree that you abolish the registered preference ticket, but with difference to you that you retain the preferential voting overall so that all votes have the same effect. They continue in the vote and they do not exhaust. This, uh, you could allow this by the voters, as you pointed out, uh, for a vote above the line. For example, you could have 10 columns, one to 10. You could vote for preferential voting. How do you voting. make sure it's only got 10 columns? Well, I'll demonstrate. I'll try and deal with some of that in a moment. Uh, on a yeah, closed party can, piece. Look, can, look, can I, look, I'll respond to you. I think the most important, your most important question is about wasted votes. And I'll address that, address that directly. The current system elected somebody with 0.2% and somebody with 0.5%. That's far lower than anything that's been produced in New South Wales. I acknowledge that there is an issue with wasted votes and does the last position go to a highest remainder method. Now, if a party is interested to try and ensure somebody wins that last seat correctly, it's therefore in their interest to encourage people to give preferences and to use some form of preferential voting. But if the alternative is to retain full preferential voting and bring back a record informal vote, then you're just disenfranchising people again. Not necessarily, because the expert... No, uh, informal when votes the number disenfranchise of... people. They are Why? trying to give a valid vote and you are saying, I'm sorry, you haven't met the rules, you're out. I was going to point out that if you use the save, uh, South Australia saving position at the yep. bottom, you well, do that's that. That's ticket voting. No, no, no. Yeah. Can we move on to the next question? We'll move on to the next question. Thank you, sir. Next. On the Is ground it? floor. Yes, it's uh, working. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gitt, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Shankar Chatterjee. And uh, Austrian Constitution 6 and 9 empowers the parliament to change the electoral laws. Now, the current system is definitely not satisfactory because it's 0.2% of primary votes. They are getting one senators for six years, sort of things. So is it possible that we scrap the Senate election the way we are doing now and replace it by the proportion of primary votes pulled by the political parties? We elect six senators usually, if it is not a double dissolution. So 16.67%, if the Greens, you know, polls more than 16% in the House of Rep, you know, contest, they get one, like Labour could get three. You could, you could. Um, what, what you, you're talking about getting rid of preferences altogether, which is, I mean, that's a perfectly valid um, proportional representation system around the world. Plenty of countries around the world are fully functioning democracies with party-based voting and no candidate choice. So to say that that's undemocratic is to say there's a whole bunch of countries which are undemocratic, which are perfectly good functioning democracies. Um, if you go down that path, you may want to sort of have a bigger say over the internal democracy of political parties, because if they're being recognised in that way, perhaps the state should have some say in how, how they run, in, run their internal politics. There are some questions, and you, you can leave it to constitutional experts on this, the use of the word directly elected by the, um, by the people, which is in the constitution. Um, now, my view is that that actually was a 
trans transfer from saying elected by the Houses of Parliament to being elected by the people. So I think sometimes that there's too much weight given to that phrase. But if you abandon voting for candidates altogether, remove that option from the ballot paper, the first challenge to the law would come on the basis of the people aren't being directly elected. So that, that is one of the problems in constitutional experts, because the, the High Court doesn't look at the constitutional debates. That's where the origin of the phrase is, but it's not part of their, they look at the words in the constitution because they're accepted by referendum. Um, so there would be problems with going down that path, and the main reason is because people wouldn't be given candidate choice. But it, it is an option, but the Australian way has always been to have some form of preferential voting, and so some, some modification of the current system is the most likely outcome. Well, thank you very much. Let's go back upstairs. Yes, thank you. Uh, you said uh, at the commencement of your uh, speech that uh, the Senate uh, is a house of review and that it's also a state's house. And uh, my question deals with it being a state's house. And uh, the, I would say the biggest issue when it comes to the Senate is that Tasmania is heading towards becoming, let's say, a rotten borough. And that is the biggest issue facing uh, elections for the Senate. So my question is, would you agree with me that one of the ways of getting us to face this big issue is to make Senate election day as miserable a day as we can possibly make it for the electors and especially for people like you. Um, look, the, the issue, the, look, I, I, it was in preparing for this speech, I went back to Quick and Garen's annotated constitution, which is a wonderful, it's a fascinating thing to dig through. Um, but in the segments I quoted in relation to uh, section seven of the constitution, they made the point that the equal representation of states was the keystone of the arch of federation. It just wasn't going to happen without that. Now, once they'd made that decision, the other things flowed from it, which was the creation of the double dissolution power. And then for those who know the constitutional debates in, 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 in the 1890s, there was also the last minute change just to weaken the Braddon clause and to um, weaken the, um, the double dissolution joint sitting provisions so that the Senate had slightly less blocking power. So, right, um, there was an extraordinary compromise. You can't fix the equal representation of the in the Constitution without unpicking the entire Constitution. Because, in fact, you, you need more than four of the six states to agree. You need every state to agree to have its representation changed. So it's, it's very hard to unpick. The Constitution is there, and we, we have to live with it the way it is. Um, and that's just one of the problems we have. Another question upstairs. Uh, Mr Green, you said at the conclusion of your speech that the Senate should reflect the will of the people. At the beginning of the speech, you also said, as I recall, something like 20% of the people vote for minor parties. Does this suggest that 20% of the senators should be coming from minor parties? And how would you achieve that? It's achieved currently by preferences, but been in a manner which sees parties. Let's be blunt about this. There was a deliberate putting of extra candidates on the ballot paper to increase the size of the minor party vote. That is the tactic that is adopted. You flood the ballot paper with parties. People can't find the candidates they're looking for and end up voting for somebody else. And once you've voted for the ticket above the line, it's captured, it's in the pool, off it goes. That's what's wrong with the current system. So every time you see, we saw this in New South Wales in 1999 when there were 264 candidates on the ballot paper. It was a deliberate attempt to increase that pool and capture the votes with tickets. Um, the next election um, with a smaller ballot paper, did that vote all go to the minor parties that still existed? No, it just went back to major parties. It went to the established parties, the ones that were around. Um, if you want to represent those parties, the 20 per cent, look, that's, that's a perfectly valid thing, but why are you adopting a system like Mr Dropilich? Why did he win that seat rather than the 15 parties that got more votes than him? That's what's wrong with the system as it is working with ticket voting, is this extraordinary randomness and, and preordained nature of it created by the tickets. If, if the whole issue in Western Australia about those last two seats determined by this strange choke, choke point in the count would not happen if voters gave their own preferences because there is no way a count between two candidates with one and three quarter percent could have that much impact on the eventual outcome of the election. Um, so that's, if we'd moved down the path of, as someone was talking about wasted votes, you would still get minor parties elected because if a party got eight to nine percent of the vote and there was a high exhausted vote, they could still get elected. 
but I'd rather see from a pool of 20% of the vote for a minor party, I'd rather see the party with more vote get elected than the one at the bottom of the pile who's managed to arrange a lot of preference deals. Let's come back downstairs and then I'll go back upstairs. Uh, hi, Tony. Um, I'm wondering if you had uh, looked at a system that I, that I believe is called border. I believe it's used in Nauru and some other places uh, in that system. Can I cut you short? Yeah, go on. How the hell do you count them? I mean, there's four million ballot papers. You're going to have to enter them all into a computer system, every one of them. <laughs> just, it's just not practical. It's not practical for other than some very, very tiny options. Okay, you, you know, understand the system I'm talking about? Yeah, you have, to, you have to actually allocate what number they put on the ballot, but you can't count them by hand. You have right. to computerize. And you, see, currently, one of the problems is with any reform that has to be considered, currently we data enter 5% of ballot papers, and then it's a very long, complex count. Under a border count, you have to enter every ballot paper. You wouldn't have a hope of counting them by hand. So that's what the problem is. So. <laughs> Upstairs. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Anthony, for, uh, for a most eloquent speech. Oh, plus, um, if Nauru's your example. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree very much that reforms are needed so that, uh, as you suggest, to allow electoral electors true preferences to be um, implemented. Uh, what about electronic voting as, a, as another way of allowing true preferences to be represented? We do it in the ACT and it it's, would be great to have an option in the federal elections as well for electronic voting. Oh, it will come. Um, one of the responses people had to me when I was complaining about the size of the ballot papers is, why don't we have electronic voting? And my response was, you get the same, you get the same problem. People pay more attention to the top of the screen than the bottom of the screen. And you sort of, um, if you have got a gigantic ballot paper, then the actual size of the ballot paper starts to interfere and can interfere in the, in the Senate. But then you also get, you can say, well, randomise the candidates. Well, you've got this constant problem of trying to get around the fact you've got so many candidates that the voters, have, you, you're interfering with voters' expression of will just simply by the number of candidates that are there. So, someone was calling the San Diego Courthouse. Of course, remember the American solution to a lot of these problems has always been to have primaries. You've got to get through a process to get on the ballot paper in the first place. Now, they've gone down that path more than any other country in the world, but essentially we have a, a similar, slightly weaker version with nomination deposits and uh, requiring the number of nominators. So uh, um, electronic voting will come. It will start with things like pre-poll voting. Um, I covered the Griffith by-election on Saturday night. They took nearly 7,000 votes at the pre-poll voting centre. That's very difficult for them to count on the night. That's a lot of ballot papers. Um, so that. Um, just sheerly the difficulty of counting those ballot papers and dealing with the paperwork will encourage electronic voting starting with pre-poll votes and postal votes. It, it will come, but it's a, it's a mechanism. It's not a solution to democracy. Yeah. Adam. Um, thank you, Tony, for a wonderful um, seminar. It's been fabulous. I wonder if in your deliberations with regard to reform that you've thought about or, or intend um, putting forward a recommendation with regard to the lack of representation of ACT voters in the Senate. As you would be aware, we have something like 350,000 people. Tasmania has something like 500 and something. Um, and yet they have, what, 12 senators, and I think we have two. Um, the, 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 <laughs> um, good luck. One, one, of the, one of the difficulties that applies there is that um, if you increase the number of ACT senators, you may well influence the balance of power in the Senate. And so any attempt to change that is going to cause a great deal of sort of um, interest. Um, I think a bigger issue might actually be representation in the House. And I think that um, the current formula actually makes it very difficult for the ACT to get a third seat. And uh, I think it's got a population which probably justifies it. But the, the mechanism which has been copied from the Constitution actually makes it very difficult. And I think, I think that should be addressed first and is more likely to be addressed. This, I think, will be our last question. Yeah. How appropriate. Um, I wanted to query your proposition that there'd be a need to a change for the counting rules if you had optional preferential voting, because at the moment it's possible to have exhausted votes, and therefore the rules cope quite adequately with that. It may be desirable to make some changes to the rules based on the greater possibility, but I would argue that it's not, strictly speaking, essential. The second question I'd like to raise is about Senate casual vacancies, because the elephant in the room here, when we talk about people not knowing who they're getting, is the number of people who are appointed by state 
parliaments. Uh, we have the case of Senator Carr, who's hit his wicket before the ball's even been bowled, and we have no idea what we're going to get next year. Uh, is there anything that can be done about that? Oh, the second one, I mean, we can try and come up with another mechanism, but in the end, the Constitution provides a mechanism where the State Parliament appoints somebody from the same party. And whatever we put in the Electoral Act, as, as Michael would well know, um, in relation to the Senate recounts after double dissolutions, what's in the Electoral Act can be ignored if the Constitution says something else. Um, and, and that's the problem of filling the casual vacancies. On the question of the dealing with the preferences, look, I, I, that is a consequence of if once you adopt optional preferential voting, there are things you can look at in terms of how preferences are distributed. Um, the ACT in Tasmania use a very similar system for in their hair clerk system. But in the ACT, they exclude exhausted preferences when somebody's elected and don't include them in the surplus. In Tasmania, they do include them in the surplus. Uh, New South Wales excludes exhausted votes. So there's different ways of doing it. I, I think it's largely a matter of, um, it, it may depend on how many exhausted preferences we're going to get, but I think it's something that needs to be considered if you go down the path of optional preferential voting. Well, I think we've just all spent a, a, a splendidly interesting and informative hour, and uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Anthony Green for his wonderful presentation. And, and thank you, the audience, for packing out the venue. Well done. <laughs> <laughs>